the event today. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, the first Executive Women's Forum event of 2022. We made it. Oh my gosh, we made it. Can you believe it? So thank you so much for being here today. And um, I am so excited about today's event. And I just want to tell you how awesome it is to have Angel Henry with us. But before I introduce her, what I do want to remind you of is that special event that Maria mentioned, which is February 25th with Dr. Vivian Citron. I know we are so tired of COVID, aren't we? We're tired of masks. We're tired of controversy. Um, and But you know what? It's still with us and there's more of it to come. So what's great about this event, it's a 45 minute event and it's right before we're all gearing up to go on spring break. So it's going to be really important to attend to understand, hey, this is what I need to think about Um as I'm hopping on that plane or I'm getting in that car, um, you know, it'll be great information for you um, so you can be safe and enjoy your spring break. So I am so excited today to have Angel Henry here. And if I may share, she is a member of my girl tribe. She is an inspiration and I am so happy to have her here. So, um, I want to share with you, Angel Henry is a ceiling breaker. She's a published author with a passion for diversity in tech. Her knowledge of why women and minorities are oftentimes missing from the C-suite provides awareness for technology leaders to drive change. This is what we need them to know, right? Um, Angel has over 20 years uh, IT experience, primarily in pharmaceutical and healthcare industries, and over 15 years in project management discipline. And she's an agile Jedi. So if you didn't know that, she's an agile Jedi. Um, I have to get this woman a lightsaber. Um, when Angel is not coaching IT consultants across the globe as a senior director, teaching IT students at Ivy Tech or speaking, she is in the Northwest Indianapolis with her husband raising two children, Mariah, a daughter in junior high school and DJ, a very active kindergartner. And that little guy is very active. Um, before Angel speaks, we are going to hear a song very special to her, um, a song by We the Kings. And then the next voice you will hear will be Angel Henry. And when you heard, I feel it too. And sometimes it feels like we're going nowhere fast For every step forward, take two steps right back I hope that it helps to know I'll help however I can Cause I am an ally and I am a friend and you have my heart and my voice and my hands And even a warrior needs somewhere to rest And I am an ally and I am a friend So be bold, be brave, be strong And show them that stone walls can fall and sometimes it feels like we're going nowhere fast For every step forward, take two steps right back I hope that it helps and know I'll help however I can Cause I am an ally and I am a friend and you have my heart and my voice and my hands And even a warrior needs somewhere to rest And I am an ally and I am a friend There we are. I am an ally and I am a friend. You have my heart, my voice, and my hands. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we will be talking about today. So with that, hopefully you're seeing the first title slide, is that correct? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome, okay. So we are here uh, this morning to talk about inclusive leadership, but more importantly, the creation of active allies and how we are all on this journey together as you are about to find out. Uh, there's no sage on the stage here by any stretch. Uh, and we're all in this journey in this community of allyship together. And that requires some very thoughtful, intentionality, empathetic action. That's a lot. Those are a lot of words, right? So how do we do that? How do we do that in the most effective, impactful way possible so that we are all collectively moving the needle in the right direction? Well, let's find out. Of course, the clicker is not working. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so um, for the first poll, I want to check in. So normally how this works, if we were in person, I would be getting your energy. I'd be getting your vibes. I'd be seeing your faces. I'd be reading your body language. And I would know what type of energy we're bringing. But we're virtual. So we're going to go ahead and launch a poll. And we are going to find out what kind of energy we're bringing to the table here. So go ahead and enter it in. If it's a rough day, hey, it's okay. It happens, right? Like, like things have not gone right. Your last meeting, somebody it was contentious and you, you know, it's a little bit of negative energy coming there. That's okay. Why is like, I'm okay. I'm here. I'm open. I'm, I want to learn, but I'm, I'm kind of hanging on here, Angel. And then G is, I'm great. I'm all in. Let's do this. I just finished my espresso like Linda and I'm ready. Like you had like eight, nine hours of sleep last night and somebody made you breakfast, even if that somebody was you. That's okay. But you, but you ate. <laughs> All right. So let's see. How are we doing? Oh, okay. We've got about 10 more folks to respond and then we'll close out the poll. We're about 80% in. Thank you for those of you who are responding. All right. Okay. We're there. Let's go ahead and close it out and see how many folks... Okay, it looks like we're at right about the halfway mark of folks are like, I'm here. I'm showing up and I pushed through and I'm here. I appreciate that. I want to honor <laughs> your time. Let's see, are we sharing the results? Okay, can you guys see that now? Yeah, so uh, about, you know, a good, a good portion of us out there are like, we're here. I get it, understandable. So my goal for today is to make sure that you walk out of here with at least one, maybe two actions and tips that you can take with you that can help you guide and navigate through this allyship experience for yourself and for those in your community and those that you work with. Okay, so thank you for your time and for allowing me to be here. All right. Hopefully my, my clicker will work now. Let's see. That's so weird. My clicker doesn't want to work. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this is a photo of myself and a lady named Deb. And this is a story that's all about how we don't always get it right when we talk about allyship. I do not always get it right. Okay. So this is clearly, obviously, right, pre-pandemic. Um, it's actually taken the last part of January, first part of February in 2020. We were in sunny, beautiful Orlando, Florida for a company kickoff. And um, Deb had been a part of my team since July of 2019, eh, about the end of July or so. So we'd known each other for a few months when this photo was taken. Well, that week actually was the last week we were together because Deb left my team. See, what had happened, that's how all stories start off, right? What had happened? Yeah, what had happened was it was July of 2019. I was in upstate New York for a conference and um, Deb was back in, I believe at the time she was probably in Arizona and she was reporting to a colleague of mine, a VP of IT, and him and her were just button heads, right? It was just a very contentious working relationship. 
Now, interestingly enough, though, as I found out later, Deb is super smart. I mean, Deb has tons and tons of years of experience as a very senior executive level program manager. She knows her stuff forward and backwards. Uh, she, I'm sure she'd been doing the job way longer than I had. So what was the issue? Well, Deb had complained to yet another senior leader and he saw an opportunity to move Deb to my team. So he reached out to me, I'll never forget. He called me, it was like, it was July 11th, 2019. He calls and he's like, Angel, I've got somebody. I think that she could join your team. And I'm thinking, what, are, are you passing like a bad limit off to me? Like, what is this about? What are you talking about? I Let me build my own team, sir. Thank you very much. I got this. And he's like, no, no, really. I think she's really good. I'm like, well, how much do you know about her? So I'm already skeptical, right? I'm already like, oh, I don't know. What's this about? So he's like, well, just talk to her. Just have a conversation. Okay, fine. So she called. Poor thing. She was in fight or flight mode by the time she got a hold of me. Okay, so she had just had a complete argument with this with her boss and uh, things were going downhill quick. She was at the point where she was considering leaving the organization, maybe even leaving the company as a whole. As I found out, I was kind of her latch just ditch effort. I was the last person that she's like, okay, maybe if I can move to this team, there's some hope. So I said, okay, reluctantly, now, the problem is she came onto my team, she reported to me, but she still had to support that other VP of IT who was not supportive of her. Now, at that point, what Deb really needed was an active ally. And I wasn't. I really wasn't dialed in to her issues or her emotions. I really wasn't completely empathetic to her plight and to how um, her self-esteem had been had deteriorated with her relationship with this person. Um, I kind of was thinking of, oh, she's a senior leader. She's got it. She'll be fine. And I really didn't in our one-on-ones, we really didn't connect. I really didn't give her the time and attention that she needed. Well, as a result, I was all busy growing my team and, and you know, leading my roadmap and, and doing my thing and kind of left her to manage that particular person and that particular problem program on her own. Well, the program concluded, very messy by the way, but it did end at the end of December. And by that point, she had already interviewed and was already transitioning to another department in the company, which I get. So that was a picture of where um, she had just told me a couple of weeks prior. And the first time we had actually, one of the first time, second time we had actually met in person and saw each other. Um, and so it was a, a bittersweet goodbye. And again, in hindsight, I realized how I could have showed up better for Deb. So I tell you that story to say, again, we're all on a journey. I have missed opportunities. You've probably had missed opportunities. And let me tell you, other folks have had missed opportunities as well. So I couldn't make this up. All right. It was exactly three weeks ago. I got a DM in my LinkedIn from a gentleman reaching out to me and said these words. So the context was we were in a meeting and one of the panelists at the meeting made what I considered a very non-inclusive comment. <laughs> and so I, I literally physically stood up and spoke up. And apparently the sentiment was pretty much the same in the audience because afterwards I had quite a few emails and quite a few um, text messages afterwards supporting me. But note, I was the only one who stood up in the meeting and spoke out. So this gentleman reaches out to me on LinkedIn and says, hey, I wanna first acknowledge that I apologize. I had an opportunity to support you and I did not do it. So first we have acknowledgement, we have an apology, and then he speaks and says, I should have spoken up to affirm your opinions so that you didn't feel alone. Sorry for that. I'll do better next time. And so now you have the commitment to change. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a formula now, just in this quick little DM message on LinkedIn. We have a formula that says, I acknowledge my part. I apologize for the missed opportunity. 
here's what I'm going to do next time. And I commit to doing it. And he followed up. So him and I actually have a meeting on the calendar um, next week. So I'll get a chance to meet him. We didn't connect obviously in that meeting, but whatever I said, so moved him to where he really wants to learn how to be a better active ally. Next, um, from the book, Dents in the Ceiling, right? We have a reviewer that says, hey, look, thanks for highlighting the, the journey of African-American women and the narratives and the experiences that they have in corporate America. It brings to light these issues of non-inclusion so that we know how to do better at listening and understanding and most importantly, acting. This is an important resource to being a better ally. And then finally, a reviewer says, as a white female who spent most of her career in corporate America, I found the book to be eye-opening. I appreciate the sections on when to be mindful, what to be mindful of, what to look out for, what to be aware of as an ally. So I can keep my eyes open and speak up for a sister and help when I can. Because remember in the song, for those of you that um, were not with us when we, we played the song earlier, the lyrics are, you have my heart and my voice and my hands. And that is the recipe for being an active ally. So where can this go wrong? I mean, how can this go really, really wrong? I mean, there are some, as my grandmother would say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? <laughs> so we have some really good hearted, empathetic folks out there that are committed to doing good work and doing well, but somehow, somehow they still miss the mark. Somehow it still doesn't land and it's not quite right. Well, how this can go wrong quickly and how we want, what we want to do to avoid falling into this bucket is what we call the valley of hypocrisy, right? We want to stay away from that. So what I mean by that is we were all part of organizations, companies, associations, nonprofits that about the summer of 2020, they all threw up the banner of essentially saying we stand with black people on their website. That's kind of the long and short of it. Now, the funny, ironic, sad part about this is that everybody was doing it, even Fox News. Now, for those of you that don't know why that's funny, sad, or ironic, well, in the African-American community, there are news outlets, newspapers, um, um, social media platforms that traditionally we think are skewed to being non-inclusive or skewed to showing African-Americans in a bad light. Fox News happens to be one of those news outlets. So it was quite ironic for Fox News to throw up their banner as well, again. Funny, sad, ironic, whatever adjective you want to use, at the end of the day, it comes across as being very hypocritical. The reason why this is hypocritical is that if you've had a track record, if you have had a pattern of behavior that has been a part of the majority and supporting the non-inclusive environments, and all of a sudden you now have this awareness, this awakening, you read a couple of books like Dents in the Ceiling or, or, or other, and you're like, oh, I see now where I could have done things differently. I see now where there are opportunities for me to support other women or support other ethnic, culture, or racial underrepresented populations. Okay, let me go to it. Well, hold on. <laughs> the pause is we don't want to look and come across as being hypocrites, okay? Here's an example for me. I happen to be heterosexual. I happen to be married to a man. I never, not once in my life, had to think twice about putting the picture of my husband and I on my desk at work. I never, not once when I was getting married, thought to keep our marriage and our partnership secret. It was out in the open and everybody was celebrating us getting married. Never, not once did it enter my mind that there are other people in my company, maybe even on my team that are keeping their partnership 
with their loved one quiet. So for me to all of a sudden, literally the next day, start supporting LGBTQ communities would be at least an eyebrow raise, right? Because it's like, well, well, Angel, you're not a part of that community. You're married to a man. What do you know? Right. So folks, so myself, I'll use myself included. So I might be hesitant to be an active supporter because quite frankly, I don't have any cred. Okay. So the thing that I have to do to bridge that gap, to make that connection is to reach out, to talk to someone, to make it known that I'm a safe place, right. To put my, my gender, my pronouns up on my, my social media platforms, um, maybe to, to um, reach out and be specific about wanting to talk to folks that are from that community and learn more and educate myself and get curious as to what the issues are and build that empathy. And in doing so, I can build trust. And once that trust is established, I now have awareness. I now have empathy. You now have my heart and my head and now I can act. So that's the formula. Awareness and empathy. We're gonna unpack that in a few more slides. Then we're gonna to move to very actionable, practical tips and guidance points that you can do. You're gonna walk away with some specific things that you can do and say once you have that awareness and you've built that empathy and trust. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about assembling of others. How do we keep this going? Okay, awareness. So let's be clear. I'm gonna give you the cliff notes first and we're gonna to skip to the end, okay? All right, at the end of the day, white women and black women have different experiences in the workplace, okay? Period, point blank. Well, why is that? Well, interestingly enough, researchers have found out that typically, not all, but traditionally, white women see their identity and navigate the world through their lens of gender first. So they think I'm female first, and then they identify with class, race, ethnicity, culture, history, that comes later. Traditionally, not all, African-American women tend to identify, navigate the world and see everything through race first, then gender, class, culture, ethnicity behind you. So now you have a group of women, all women, that identify as being female, and white women are leading with the fact that they're women, but African-American women are leading with the fact that they're African-American. So now you can see why it's so interesting how we put all these groups of women together, how there's different nuances in terms of, okay, we, we might have an inclusion problem, but we might have to go about solving that problem differently. Okay, so again, I gave you the Cliff Notes version. There's more to it. The quantitative and qualitative information comes from the book, Our Separate Ways. Authors Bell and Nicomo unpack in great detail the narratives and the history all the way from grade school, literally grade school, all the way up through to the executive ranks in the C-suite of well over 50, I think maybe even 75 women, white women and black women who have navigated their way in marketing, HR, IT, finance, you name it, and how they have experienced the world and and the experiences that have shaped them and their identity. And again, Cliff Notes version is that's the theme that they found. So here it is in a diagram. Again, we all have this, men, women, everybody. If you're human, you have, and you're living in the United States particularly, you have these aspects of your identity. But depending on which aspect you're leading with is going to shape how you think and how you see and how you navigate the world. This is why it is absolutely critical to have a diverse board of directors and a diverse network of personal and professional Girl Tribe members 
that you can understand and connect with and see different aspects of things and, and how they navigate differently. So for example, we've all walked out of a corporate meeting where you're thinking to yourself, that meeting went south. That, oh my gosh, we didn't meet any of our goals and objectives. We deviated from the agenda and you're frustrated and confused and you don't even know what to do next, right? You're like, I hope somebody like summarizes the meeting and sends out some action items because that meeting was chaos. And you could talk to a colleague who was in the meeting and they come to, that meeting was great. That was such a dynamic conversation. We, oh my gosh, we got so much done. That was so great. And you're thinking to yourself, how is it that we experienced the same thing and walked out with two totally, completely different experiences and thoughts? Well, it's our filters. It's how we navigate. It's how we see ourselves. It's how we take in information. So now we're aware that people are having different experiences in our teams, in our departments, at our companies, different than us. Um, I want you guys to um, do me a favor. In the chat, I want to see, let me bring up the chat. I want to see if who watched the Super Bowl this past Sunday. Just go ahead and put in the chat, yes. If you saw the Super Bowl, just say yes, 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 yes. yes. I want to see all the yeses. Okay. All right. Okay. So by the way, I'm a butt guy, so no one says anything about the Rams. We're just going to like put that to the side. So I'm seeing some yeses. Okay. Now, if you did not see the Super Bowl, if you're like, there was a Super Bowl on Sunday, just go ahead and put that. Like, you know, you're like, I, I'm not down for watching the pregame. I didn't watch any of the commercials. I don't even know who was in it. Nope. Didn't see it. Don't have a clue. Okay. We got a few notes out there. I, I'm with you. I understand. It was my first Super Bowl in a few years, too. Um, so for those of you who missed it, let me bring you up to speed. In the beginning, before they even did the kickoff, during the coin toss, they had the honorable Billie Jean King do the coin to toss. So for those of you who don't know Billie Jean King, she is famous. She's infamous for being a famous uh, tennis athlete. But she's actually more famous for what she did off the court and that is her activism and um, her leading in justice and equality and equity, particularly for female athletes. Okay, so this is uh, the famous Billie Jean King. She's doing the coin toss, but before she does the coin toss, they do a little infomercial with her speaking. And if you guys didn't catch it, let me tell you what she said, it was profound. She said, and I actually wrote it down because I did not want to misquote her, Billie Jean King said, it's hard to understand inclusion until you've been excluded. Wow. I love that said. It's hard to understand inclusion until you've been excluded. Well, what are some of the types of exclusion that we're talking about here, Angel? I'm glad you asked. They're profound. Right? They're profound and oftentimes, too often, they're overt. So for example, I read an article where an African-American woman was in a break room. It was all women and a group of women were talking and chatting about the upcoming event that was going on at one of the women's houses on Friday. And they're chatting about you know, what to wear, what to bring, all that good stuff. So she decides to include herself. So she says she physically moves closer to the conversation and to the women that are talking and starts asking questions about the event. And I guess they now pick up on the fact that she's hinting around that maybe she wants to come too. Well, the woman whose house the event is going to be at says, oh yeah, you can come to my house, but the only way you're going to get there is if you're carrying a pail and wearing a rag on your head and you want to come to my home. And that was just quoted last year. Right? This is not something from the 70s, 80s, or 90s. This, this was an article that was written literally just last year. Um, I myself interviewed women. And uh, the context of this next quote is that one woman said she was approaching a Caucasian colleague, a peer of hers. Um, he was at his cube working. Apparently, she interrupted his working, and he did not like that. And so he decided to be what he felt, I guess, rude right back to her and says, wait, why are you talking to me? It's not Black History Month yet. I can't imagine the re her initial feelings 
um, of disrespect and shock and hurt. But again, because of that stereotype of angry black woman, she had to temper her response and could not visibly show anger to him in that moment. I wonder what it would have been like if his cue mate had overheard that conversation and spoke up on her behalf. No one did. And then lastly, um, I interviewed a woman. She was a very senior engineer, a program engineer at a very large global multinational company. If I said the name, you guys would all know who it is. Um, so it's an engineering company. She's senior program engineer. She's in the room with all of her peers. They had an engine failure. They're all sitting there talking about it. These are, you know, VPs and, and above. Well, the SVP is sitting at his desk and he's looking through his computer, trying to find the reports and the printouts of the information that they're talking about. He couldn't find it. He's frustrated. And she speaks up and she says, well, I sent it to you last night. And he says, do you want me to put your, my, um, do you want me to put your head through the computer and see that I don't have it in front of everyone, right? I wonder what it would have been like had one of those other VPs and senior leaders spoke up on her behalf. Oh, oops, went too far. Okay. So um, those are anecdotal stories, okay? But for those of you that are my data folks out there, I wanna give you a couple of graphs and charts too. So essentially there are um, large think tanks out there like Lean In, um, CTI, Harvard Business Review for Women that study women in the workplace, essentially. And what they found in, in this chart here on the left is just bifurcated between women and men. Right. So they're asking questions like, how well do you feel supported at work? Does your supervisor give you opportunities for advancement? Do you get feedback? You know, just basic. How's your experience at work? Now, what's interesting about this graph, if you guys notice, none of the numbers are great. Like we got some serious work to do in corporate America for everybody, men and women. I mean, there's no number on here that's like 50, 60, 70 percent. No one is off the charts on this one. Everybody there's some work to be done for sure, no matter who you are. But when you just segment out between men and women, you start to now see a little bit of a difference where the men are just literally just a few points higher in their responses in terms of you know, positivity. But now when you start layering in race, so now we have not just women, but we have black women, um, white women, Latina women, and Asian women, now we start to see the numbers kind of etch out and, and just be a little bit different. But what's most interesting is that out of all the numbers, out of everybody's numbers and percentages of responses, the Black women are the lowest. They're the ones that are not feeling the support. They're not getting the feedback. They're not feeling like their supervisors supporting them with advancement. And then on the right, um, for those of you that were with me in French Lick with Women in High Tech this past fall, you saw this uh, graph and then you saw a couple other ones that really dive deep. But for, day, for today, I just want to bring to everyone's attention that still today, we have two African-American female CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. That means that out of 500 CEOs, two are African-American females, okay? We have a lot of work to do. So Cliff Notes version. In summary, the take home message, if you didn't hear or see any of that, at the end of the day, the general pattern that we find is that women are having a worse experience in the workplace than men. Women of color are having a worse experience than white women. And Black women in particular are having the worst experience of them all. So now we are aware, now we understand that exclusion is happening and that there are different experiences that are happening in the workplace. Okay, Angel, I get it. I, I got the stories. I see the data. It's a fact. What do I do about it? Well, let's see. Let's break down the characteristics of an active ally. Empathy. 
Remember, I said, now that we're aware that differences are happening, the very next step is to make that connection, to connect with someone that has at least one or two, possibly even three degrees of separation from you. So that means if you're a white female, you're reaching out and you're connecting with um, someone who is uh, maybe of Asian descent, maybe is English is not their first language, and maybe they're in a different department than you. You're in marketing and they're over in um, IT or engineering, right? So they have a couple of degrees of separation from you and you're just reaching out to talk to them about their experience. No agenda, no hidden agenda. You're just trying to make a connection. You share your lived experience and how you got to the company and how you got to your job and you know what you love about the company, what you what, wish you could change and find out how their experience is and just make a connection and keep connecting every eh, once a quarter or so, more often with more people, right? You start getting a habit of connecting with people and you, you, it's fun, right? Um, so that's me. I'm, I'm always taking at least, at least once every other week, I want to take a meeting with someone that's in a different part of the company than me or someone that I don't know as well. Maybe even someone that's like, you know, younger, somebody that just came in from, an, from their internship to see what their experience is. So now we've got empathy because we're connecting we're, we're feeling, we're putting ourselves in their situation and feeling the feeling. The next level is emotional agility. Now, this means that we are getting a little bit more complex in our emotions. So an example, a quick example is let's take anger, right? When someone is angry, that's a first level emotion. That's the tip of the iceberg. But there's so much underneath. If someone is angry, they might be hurt, disappointed, confused. There may have been a trauma trigger. There's a, there's a lot under the surface when we just look at those initial first level emotions of just happy or sad or angry. There may be a lot under there. So, so now we're getting deeper into emotions and kind of getting the backstory and finding out why. Next, situationally astute. That means that active allies have a group of tools and they have their toolkit and they can pull out the tool appropriate for the situation, right? Sometimes you don't always need a hammer, but sometimes you do. Sometimes you might need to white glove it. That might be appropriate. Just depends on the situation, right? Next, a strong moral compass. At the end of the day, ladies, we're just talking about being human. <laughs> I know, I mean, we, we unpack that there's a lot of different identities and a lot of layers and lenses and filters that people use to navigate the world and take in information. But at the end of the day, it's a human to human connection. This is a heart issue, really. And then lastly, courageous. So I am not going to minimize or water down the fact that being an active ally is easy you will absolutely be risking your social or political or inclusion status if you speak up against the status quo, if you go against the grain. The moment you become aware of some injustices or some inequities and you want to do something about it and you speak up or you actively are going against the grain, you will come up against opposition. It's risky, it's a risky endeavor, it's bravery. You have to make that call and decide how far you're gonna lean. I'm, every, I'm almost on a, at least on an every other day basis, I'm thinking to myself, is this the hill that I wanna climb? Am I gonna fall on my sword on this one? Because if I speak up too loud, if I push the envelope too far, there might be consequences. It could be career limiting for me. So now I got to figure out how to navigate through these dicey gray area situations, which is my plug for why a community is so important. Okay, so you're like, okay, Angel, I hear you. That's all great. I got it. I'm ready to go. What do I do? Here are some specific things. Okay, so we're going to launch a poll. I think this is our last poll. Yep, we skipped the other one. That's okay. So we're going to launch a poll here. And you're going to tell me out of coaching, sponsoring, hiring, promoting, mentoring, which one do you think is the most impactful? All right. I see. Great. Okay. It's launched. Folks are responding. Yeah. 
out of all of these active ally activities, which one is really gonna move the needle the most? So while we're getting the responses, I'm gonna unpack a couple of these real quick. Let's see, how are we going on time? Okay, great. So um, when we talk about coaching, think of like traditional executive coaching, right? The, the kind that we, that we receive. You, if you're a seasoned um, in your career, uh, then you can share your lessons learned and provide coaching to the next generation down, the, the, the folks that are coming up behind you. Absolutely. Um, when we talk about promotion, this is a fun one. So when we talk about promotion, I don't necessarily mean the promote to the next level, although that's great. You can absolutely do that. Try to get somebody um, a promotion from analyst to senior analyst or from um, manager to director. That's great. But when I talk about promotion, I'm talking about this notion that happens in the Caribbean and the islands called big up. I want to big up the person. So what that means is um, my husband is from the islands. He's from Jamaica. And him and his, uh, he was born there and his family immigrated there when he was young. And so I married into the culture. And one of the aspects of the culture that they use is they big up someone. And that means that they highlight the person's skills or strengths when they're introducing that person to someone new. So for example, um, I was meeting his aunt for the first time and uh, him and I had you know, just been married a couple of years. We're at a family gathering and his sister, my sister-in-law is big upping me to the aunt. Oh, Angel's great. She's wonderful you know, blah, 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 um, you know, they're, they're about to start their family. She lives in Indy. She's got this cool job and she's just going on and on and on to me about this aunt. So now when the aunt meets me, I'm already in a positive light in her eyes. Okay. Oh, and great. We can end the poll now. Thank you. We'll, we'll share the results here in a second. Um, so uh, promotion just means that you're sharing the skills and strengths with someone when you're introducing someone new. It could be verbal or it could be written. So when you're emailing and you're doing an introduction, you are promoting that person. So that way that the new person that they're being introduced to already has um, uh, all the good things that the person is about. Now, that is so critically important for women, right, for us to do that for each other in our organizations. And then lastly, um, hiring. So there is this concept called two in a pool. You're going to remember this the next time that you have an open spot to hire or um, someone that you need to, to um, promote into or backfill. And you can also share this with your HR um, recruiters as well. Very important. Two in a row. So Harvard Business Review found this concept, this phenomenon of the, if there are at least two women in that final pool, that final candidate selection pool, you have over a 90% chance of the woman getting the job the final job, okay, but it has to be two. So this is after you put the job rec out and you, you got in a hundred folks and you kind of filtered it down and narrowed it down. And now you're down to the last, you know, three to five candidates and you got to pick. As long as there's two females, two women in that last candidate selection pool, over 90% chance that a female will get the job. Now, this is very interesting too, for those that are, that have, um, ethnic or racial underrepresentation. If you have at least two Latina, Asian, African Americans in that bottom pool, you have over a 100% chance that one of them is gonna get the final job. It's huge. So now you can remember two in a pool rule, right? When hiring and recruiting, all our recruiters uh, team should know that. And then lastly, so what's the difference between sponsor and mentorship? I'm glad you asked. So when we talk about mentorship, that's great, right? Absolutely phenomenal. Mentoring somebody, having that trusted connection where you're sharing your lessons learned, you're sharing your story, your journey in hopes that it can help them, that's phenomenal. But mentorship is kind of, well, let's just say low bar. In terms of investment, I mean, the most you're doing is you're investing your time. All right, Angel, what do you mean? Let me give you an example between mentorship and sponsorship. Let's take, I'm sponsoring a guy named Jack, okay? Um, Jack is a senior 
project manager, and he now has to um, present in front of the executive team this major project that he's been working on. First time presenting. If I'm mentoring Jack, I'm going to say, good luck, Jack. You got it. Let me, let me give you a little tips, little ways that you can present. And then, you know, a week later, I find out in the hallway, Jack bombed that presentation. Jack did not do well at all. He was totally stuttering and unprepared and didn't have the data that they asked for, and it just went south. So I bring Jack into my room, and I was like, Jack, dude, I'm sorry that that happened to you. Let me tell you a time where I bombed, and let me show you how to recover from that and what to do better next time. No big deal. I'm Jack's mentor, didn't go so well. If I'm a mentor worth my salt, I'm gonna to listen to him, I'm gonna commiserate, I'm gonna rub Jack on his back and I'm going to uh, pick him up and give him some actionable practical tips that he can do and go forth and, and do that, okay? But if I sponsor Jack, sponsor means that I'm the one that recommended Jack to do the presentation. Now my name is attached to Jack's name. If Jack bombs that presentation, you best better believe I'm gonna hear about it and I'm gonna hear about it right away. My credibility is going to be on the line. They're going to look at me and say, Angel, what were you thinking? They're going to question my ability to assess top talent. So as a sponsor, you best better believe I am going to make sure that Jack is set up for success. See, I'm going to pull Jack into the room and we're going to go over that thing and we're going to prepare and we're going to go over and over until he's home just right. I'm going to throw questions at him. I'm going to make sure he has all the data. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that Jack gets up there and knocks it out of the park. Why? Because I sponsor Jack. See, my social and political capital in the organization is tied to his success. That, ladies and gentlemen, is why 44 of you percent got it correct. Sponsorship is the thing that's going to move the needle the most. Okay. So when you're thinking about being an active ally, you're thinking about all the things that you can do, all these things are ultra important. But if we want to be active in moving the needle in diversity, equity, and inclusion, sponsorship for women and minorities is what's gonna get us there. Okay. So what else can I do? Oh, and there's more, there's always more. I've got much, much more. So what other actions? Well, ensure that others are heard. Remember the lyrics in the song, you have my heart and my voice in my hands. So what does that mean when you say my voice? Well, make sure that you're supporting other people in the meeting or um, an idea is being uh, solicited. Make sure that the person has the space and the opportunity to share their opinion. You know, call it out, make space for others. And we've heard that, but how do you actually do it? Well, you got to be aware. You have to be in tune and look around the room physically or the Zoom call and notice who isn't speaking. Uh, it might be that they're introverted. It might be that there's something else going on, but you know, maybe DM them on the side and say, hey, how are you feeling about this? You, you got an idea? You, you, you think this is a good idea? Are we going in a good direction? Oh, well, I got some questions. Hey, I encourage you to speak up, right? Make sure others' voices are heard. Next, challenge the likability and competence. Okay, Woo, ladies, this is a tough, tight rope to walk. Okay? I mean, it is a tight rope. We have to be likable and competent at the same time. <laughs> Who put those constraints on us? I don't know. Um, but it's there. It's an unconscious bias most of the time. I want you to be aware that it's there. It's not only there for all women, but it's particularly there for women of color, okay? Especially African-American women. So if you see that bias coming out where somebody says, oh, I really like her. And you're like, oh, okay, what do you like about her? Exactly, right? Something more than just, she wears pretty dresses and her hair and makeup are always done, right? What, what skills, what are her strengths? What is she bringing to the table? that you like? Is it her presentation skills? Is it the fact that she, um, you know, knows a lot about a different market? Is it, you know, get, get some hard, concrete, actionable feedback to bring to conscious the part why that person says that they like that individual. Another way, another thing, highlight other women's achievements. We already covered big upping someone, big upping another woman in the organization. Um, provide positive encouragement. 
we're going to live lesson learned from the gentleman who said, Hey, angel, sorry, I should have supported you better. So this is what you can do. You can say, I support Kelly because Kelly's idea could save us half an FTE and positively impact three teams, right? I support and say her name and why you support her idea or what she's saying. That is absolutely very, very important, especially virtually. It's important in person, but it's even more important to do it on a Zoom call or a Google Meet. Um, next, give direct, specific, actionable feedback. We don't get it. We just don't get it. Women, period, do not get good feedback based on their performance, based on what they're actually bringing to the table. Right, it just doesn't happen for us. Especially men are uncomfortable with giving women feedback. It just is what it is. We got to change it, but it is what it is right now. So until we can actively work collectively to change that, we can support each other. We can give feedback to each other. Just pull her aside, and as I would say, you straighten your sister's crown behind closed doors, right? And you send her back out there, and nobody knows that her prime was crooked. That's essentially what we're doing. Hey. Let me tell you, you were in that meeting and you were presenting and I think you were losing folks. Maybe if you put your, your, your bottom line up front point earlier, you might be able to grab their attention, right? And then, and then answer their questions from there instead of giving all the supporting information and then ending. That's great, that's actionable, that's specific. Make sure it's timely, right? Don't wait till a month later, give it to her right away, but it's needed. We need that from each other in a supportive, caring, loving way bring somebody aside and help them out. And then, like I said, we talked about sponsoring, huge. Don't walk away with anything else, remember that word. Next, um, last point around action, if then statements. These are my favorite, I love these. Okay, so think of that. I have quite a few examples here for you. Um, if you're an active ally, we've gone through awareness, we've connected, we have empathy, we've built trust, we're now ready to action, what are some actions that we can do? Well, it's the power of committing. You're creating a new habit. Now that you're aware, you're thinking, okay, how do, I, how do I act? How do I do this? Well, you have to create a plan for yourself. So if you're in a situation, what are you going to do? If I'm running a meeting, then I will ask for everyone's input or if they want to share. If I'm hiring for a new role or I'm backfilling, I will ensure that there are at least two women or those that are in an underrepresented population in the final pool. I can do that. If I notice someone is getting talked over, I will create space for them to talk. If I agree with someone in a point that they're making in a meeting, then I will provide my verbal support of them and say their name when I'm doing it. If then statements, create a plan of action and then you will be successful. Okay, now we're at the point where we're ready to assemble others. Because remember, this is a journey. We are all in this together. Everybody, how many of us are there? About 50 of us, almost 50 of us on this call right now, right? We are now all in a community. You're all a part of Women in High Tech. So we all have to support each other. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have a missed opportunity, just like I did with Deb. It's okay. Right? Or you might see something and you don't know how to navigate that at your company or on your team. You need someone else to talk to. And it's so critically important. Why? Because you don't get very far without a tribe. Yeah, I know. It's Boba Fett. He said it. I, I was creating the slide deck, you know, while I was watching Disney Plus with the kids. But it was perfect timing as I was creating the slide deck right at the time where I was talking about creating a tribe of us coming together and being on this active ally journey, boom, Bobo Fat says how important a tribe is. So I had to throw that in there. See if you guys are still awake. Okay, so this is essentially what we're going for, right? We're different ethnicities and cultures and races and backgrounds and generations are coming together and laughing and sharing and talking and supporting each other. That's the ultimate goal. And again, remember the first step of getting there is that you have to reach across the line. You have to reach across those, those lines that separate us around 
socioeconomic status, class, gender, culture, race. We have to, we have to bridge those, those gaps that sometimes keep us apart in order for us to make that connection, in order for us to, to exercise our empathy muscle and build that trust with communities that are different from us. Okay, so this is powerful, by the way. I mean, when we do this and we do this well, man, we show up and we show out. Let me tell you, on June 26, 2015, that title of all the news lines and papers was Love Wins. Why? Because collectively, men and women, heterosexual, homosexual, and every sexuality and gender um, uh, journey and continuum across the world, we all came together and banded together to fight for equal marriage. And on June 26, 2015, it was passed. That is the power of the collective. And then I want to end with this video, and I'm going to fingers crossed that it plays. <laughs> um, somebody let me know if, it, if you can hear it. No, we can't hear it. If you skate, on Wednesday, gymnast Simone Biles, Michaela Maroney, Maggie Nichols, and Ali Raisman sent a letter to Congress demanding the termination of the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee's Board of Directors. Their statement claims that the board failed to protect them from convicted sexual abuser and former Dr. Larry Nasser. They claim the USOPC knew about hundreds of abuse allegations against Nasser since the 2015-16 season and still did nothing. And last month, these four women testified to Congress that the FBI also turned a blind eye to their allegations against Nasser. During her emotional testimony, Bio said, I blame Larry Nasser, and I also blame an entire system that enabled and perpetrated his abuse. Now, these systems aren't only present in gymnastics. Take former professional soccer players Sinead Fairley and Mana Shim. Earlier this month, they, along with a number of other former women's National Soccer League players, accused their former coach, Paul Riley, of verbal abuse and sexual coercion starting in 2010. In an April email to the league commissioner at the time, Fairley wrote that as a player on the Portland Thorns, I not only witnessed, but also experienced firsthand extremely inappropriate conduct by Mr. Riley. Sinead Fairley was coached by Riley on three separate teams and claimed that he made harassing comments to her and other players and that he coerced her into having sex with him on multiple occasions. She and Shim came forward about an instance where Riley took them back to his apartment and asked them to kiss each other in front of him or else he'd punish the team with exhausting drills. Fairley says there was no serious investigation into her or anyone else's allegations against Riley. Before stepping down, the commissioner, Lisa Baird, responded to Fairley's email by saying that her 2015 allegation was investigated to conclusion, but that she couldn't share any of the details. See, it's that lack of transparency that leaves victims feeling unheard and perpetuates this climate that makes it even more difficult to come forward. It was when Fairley, Shim, and others came forward together in an article for The Athletic that Riley was finally fired. He's one of four different NWSL coaches, all men who have been fired in just the past four months for off-field misconduct, including sexual abuse and racist remarks. And Baird has resigned amid the scandal. Alex Morgan, one of the league's biggest stars, is standing with Fairley and Shim. She tells the Today Show what needs to happen for players to feel safe. Something we ask is for the league to start being proactive, not reactive. We ask for transparency. If this is allowed to happen, this total disregard for the safety of some of the country's most elite athletes, what does it mean for the people who don't have such a large platform? As actress and activist Sophia Bush wrote on Instagram, this kind of workplace abuse is widespread. So many women in so many industries have existed inside of systems that told us and showed us that there was no help to be found that our words wouldn't be heard and our pain and abuse didn't matter. Those systems are finally being blown up and dismantled. These incidents don't happen in a vacuum. 
systems allow for misconduct to persist. Whether it's Larry Nasser, some coach in Portland, or R. Kelly, or a priest, or a manager at a restaurant, removing these individual perpetrators means nothing if the powers that be prioritize abusive men over the voices of victims. And that's what these athletes understand. And that's why they're coming together to stand up against a system of enablers. And the only way to cut this problem down at the root is by making it costly to stand idly by when abuse happens. I'm Doma T. Pongo, and that's what you need to know. Wow. The power of the collective, the bravery and the courage of all of those women standing together and lending their voices together to break systems of long-standing abuse and exclusion and neglect. I wanna bring you to this last picture in the far right. That is taken on May 28th, 2021, where physically a group of mostly white women use their body to shield protesters in the Breonna Taylor protest against police. The power of the collective is real. When we come together, and recognize that there is a problem and lend our hearts and our voice and our hands to make change. What powerful change we can all make. And it's not just for us. Ladies, it's not just for us. It's for the next generation. So that's a picture of my daughter. She's the one in the middle. She's the one that has hair like mine. Um, and, and a group of her friends. That was her birthday party this past September. It's for that generation. It's for the next group of young ladies and girls and young women that are coming behind us that we owe it to them to come together and lend our hearts and our voice and our hands to making change. So with that, I implore you that if you have not, to please get a copy of the book. It's on Amazon, it's on sale. Um, Dents in the Ceiling, Tools Women and Allies Need to Break Through. In there, we not only go through awareness and empathy through women of color as they learn and, and share their experiences of navigating non-inclusive workspaces. But there's a section at the end of each chapter specifically to those that are seeking to be active allies, practical tools and techniques and guidance on how you as an active ally can navigate the space and, and what you can do to support others. Because remember, this isn't about saving, this is about how we can show up as servant leaders and help a collection of everyone to be and feel more inclusive in the workspace. And as if that wasn't enough, there is a free companion guide just released earlier this uh, month. Uh, it was uh, February 8th uh, that came out. So if you go to www.angel-henry.com, um, I'll put that in the chat you can get a free copy of your Active Allies edition book. So once you get the book, you can get the companion journal and it'll kind of help you step through how you specifically in your situation can kind of just think through how to show up and how to make these connections and how to act differently. Um, and again, this is a collective. So as you're thinking through and you're going through that workbook and you get stuck, reach out for help, right? We're all in this together. And I think I put the, let me go ahead and put in the chat, the website. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Linda's on it. Perfect. You guys have the website. That's where you'll, you'll um, be able to find out my services and, and um, get some of the, the free um, companion journals. And now we are into our, I think, if it'll let me click through. I think we're headed to our first breakout session. Is that right, Amber? Yeah. Yes, it is time. It's time. Okay, so we have some breakout rooms for you all. And when you get to your first breakout room, I'm going to go ahead and set my timer. 
Um, we're going to do eight minutes for the first one because you guys will need a, a little chance to kind of reorient yourself. So let me set it for here for eight minutes. When you get into your breakout room, you'll have eight minutes to just kind of quickly um, introduce yourselves and answer this question, right? Share a time in which someone advocated for you. How were you helped by someone else's sponsorship, mentorship, um, support, promotion, uh, promoting you, all of that? So we're going to let you loose into your um, breakout rooms. You'll have eight minutes, and you're going to talk about a time in which someone advocated for you, and then we'll bring you all back here to the collective. So you might have to click to join if you aren't sitting at your computer. And I found out the hard way that if you're logged into your laptop, but you've dialed in audio on your phone, uh -huh. you can't get into a breakout room. I had, a, I, I had that issue happen to me um, one time. Okay, well, yeah, it looks like we just have Amy and Zainab who haven't joined their rooms. Is um, that the experience that you guys are having? Yeah. Oh, oh there you are. You're on mute if you're talking, Zainab. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, oh there okay. you are. You can join one button. Did you get an invitation to join a breakout room? Sorry, I was in Teams. Yeah, I see it now. Okay, join. Okay. <laughs> Amy, how about you? Now, Amy may have walked away from her okay. desk. Gwen, how's it going? And Jesse, if you guys are there and you can hear me and you need help with your breakout room, just let me know. And uh, Linda, are you still there? Linda went into a breakout room, I think. I, I had meant not to assign her to one, but then when I was going, I just like accidentally clicked her, I think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, we, we can, I think some people are starting to drop off. Um, do you have the link to the um, feedback form? Yes, and I can put it in here now if yeah. you want. Absolutely, that'd be great. And then when yes. people come back collectively, I'll say, hey, before you leave out. Yes, let me get to it. It was in your email. All right, there we go.
I'll send them the two minute mark here. Let's see here. Hopefully that went through. Yes. <laughs> there it goes. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry about the song also. It's like. Oh, no, it worked. It, hey, it worked. It, In the end, it worked. It's fine. It, I know. Just That was Larry. I was like, hey, I didn't know Zoom could do that. You can I know. It's like you should never just look horse. at a horse in the mouth, right? I know it's like should have just assumed it wouldn't work. <laughs> it never fails. It never fails. I felt so bad. One of my colleagues, he was doing a town hall. I mean, it's global, right? Like I don't know, like five hundred people are on this call, uh -oh. and they're doing a live demo, and they had rehearsed it and practiced it, and I, I saw it. You know, right? It, it literally had just worked, maybe twenty minutes before. And all of a sudden it wasn't working. We're like, what? So yeah. Yeah. Yes. Never fails. It's all good. <laughs> okay. So when we hit close all rooms, does it still give them 60 more seconds? Um, I changed it to 15 just because I wasn't oh. sure how okay. much time we would want, but is that okay? No, good to know. That yeah. is good. Okay. Then I will give them um We'll give them 30 more seconds and then close it. Yeah. And watch, I said that and now it'll give them a minute, but dang yeah. it. <laughs> so like now-ish. I don't know how the time we're going. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Time. Yep. We're good. Oh, yep. It's a minute. Oh, save a minute. Okay. A minute. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. What That's is okay. the point? <laughs> no, say, it's funny. The exact same thing happened to me. I thought I had changed the setting and then I hit it. I'm like, oh, let's give them another minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we see folks coming back. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, everyone, welcome back. I think we've got everybody, maybe just a couple. Maybe a couple rooms still chatting. Good, that's good. That's what we want. Yeah. That is exactly what we want. Sharing, sharing the goodness. All right, here they come. Yay. You guys got zoomed back in. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Welcome back. I see faces. Yay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh look, there's Rebecca. Hi. Okay, I'm excited. Like, I feel like I'm back in person with you guys now. Okay, great. Thank you for, for coming off um uh and showing your faces so um hopefully you guys so so the the intent of that we won't do a debrief i'll do a debrief for the next one but the intent of that was for you guys to get ideas about how other people have advocated for other people right so now you're like oh wow you know if rebecca shared something that said you know hey this person really helped me they came you know they didn't even know me that well they really supported me here's how they did it now you have some actionable practical tips. You just heard from a few different other people about how they were supported. Now you know how you can show up for others as well. Okay, so that was the point of that exercise. All right, so for this one, we're gonna get a little bit more personal, all right? We're gonna to move to another breakout. So you guys will probably be mixed up again. So you probably won't be with your same group. That's okay, that's what we want, right? We want different perspectives. So this next breakout, is going to be about how have you advocated for someone else? And more importantly, what was the outcome? Okay, so this one, you can get a little more personal. You can share a story like I did where you, you tried to advocate. You thought you were doing the right thing, but it didn't maybe work out so well. And what you learned from that, or you stepped out on faith, and you advocated, and it was a phenomenal relationship that you, you know, forged a best friend to this day, right? You had a great outcome. So share the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've all now built some trust at this point, right? We've all shared some, some lessons learned that weren't so great. Now's the time to share how you have stepped up and advocated for someone else. 
and what was the outcome? That's the most important part of that discussion. So this time we're going to give you six minutes and launch you out to your break rooms. Okay, see you back here in six minutes. Bye-bye. Okay, we are doing really great on time. Yes, I was getting worried, but I think we are doing awesome as well. Yeah. yeah. So Angel, it looks like in the chat, Linda Calvin said, we'll have one more breakout room and then Q and A and wrap up. So are we gonna skip the third one? Uh, we, can, we, we can, um, when, we come, when we come back um, together, I can do, I'll, I'll debrief with like, just, I'll just ask for one or two people to share. Mm -hmm. And then, and then we, we can do the third breakout or not. I'm totally open either way. We'll, let's see. Oh, bring up the chat and see what she see if I can chat her directly. Okay, we'll have one more. And then Q and A around. Okay, maybe she's meaning one more breakout. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay, we'll see. We'll ask her. Yeah, when she comes back in, we'll check in. Because I know I think it was from I, if I if memory serves I don't know I think it was twelve thirty five or twelve forty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and then like 10 minutes for questions exactly and then like 10 minutes for wrap up so i think that'll be okay fine okay, okay.
Should I go ahead and close the room since we only want to leave them for another minute? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, let's do that. Okay, I see folks coming back in. Hello, hello. Welcome back all. Okay. All right. So this one I do want to hear. So do I have two brave souls who were willing to come off mute and share how they advocated for someone? But more importantly, what was the outcome? I'm, I want to know. Angel, I'll go. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the story I shared was um, in a former role, uh, I had a young man who was a direct report and um, I wrote a glowing, an absolute glowing uh, performance management review and recommended this young man for the highest uh, raise you could give, exceeded expectations. But also as part of that feedback, um, I gave some feedback to say, while he's great, um, he needs to have more respect for middle managers. And especially I've had some women come forward to share that they felt like maybe he um, could speak a little better to them, that they, they felt like he could sometimes be a little condescending. And so I think that's an area of work for him. But he was just a very awesome person. You talk about not having to manage someone. I mean, he was just great and I wanted to see him excel. And so what happened was, um, I submitted my review very early in the process. And, you know, that's a lot because it's an HR process, right? Most people, we are waiting till the last minute, but I submitted early because I was really excited. Um, several months later, I got a message from HR saying you hadn't submitted. I, I wondered why. And so I looked and it was stuck with my boss and I contacted my boss and I said, HR said that they didn't get my review and I wanted to understand why. Um, and he told me it's because your feedback, um, I'm very concerned that down the way this feedback could harm him and instructed me that I needed to change it. And not only should I change it, um, but it needs to be more positive. I had to um, because he said he would not submit it further through the process unless I did change it. Um, that young man did get a promotion shortly after he was promoted away from me um, and I received negative feedback. So probably not exactly the example you were looking for, but I really did lean in to advocate. And, it, and as it ends up, I, I got bruised as part of it because I really felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do as a leader. No, that is an absolutely phenomenal example because again, it was risky whenever you're advocating for someone in this way, she's advocating very positively, right? She definitely wants to see the, this person excel. And in her way of seeing this person excel, it's, hey, I want you to smooth out a little, few rough edges so that you can, you know, soar, right? So that nothing's holding you back. She's, she's leaning in with phenomenal intentionality, um, but it unfortunately did not land on this middle person very well. I'm interested in what HR would have said if they had read that, what their comments would have been, but apparently they didn't even get the opportunity to read it. And so Linda, I'm curious, you changed it? You, you did remove that piece of feedback? I did, I was instructed to. Okay, and did he, I'm curious, did this individual ever receive that feedback even verbally? No. The other ladies, see? Okay. No. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we get senior leaders, male and female, that continue on through up the ranks and through the, the process and they don't get the needed feedback. I remember I honed in on that. People aren't getting the feedback that they need, right? And so we end up with people leaders um, that, that end up unintentionally doing trauma and damage to their people underneath them because they aren't quite ready, right? So feedback is essential. Uh, and I am so sorry, Linda, that that happened to you and that you were not listened to and trusted as a leader and as a people leader to give the appropriate feedback to a person who you work with on an everyday basis. Uh, I'm sorry that happened, but it is a phenomenal lesson learned to all of us and to remember that advocacy is not without risk. One other brave soul that wants to share. If not, no worries, we can move on. Okay, so Linda, real quick, do we have time for another five minute breakout or do we wanna go ahead and move to q and I'm fine either way. We probably should, we probably should move to Q&A. Okay, all right, let's do it. I think, I think I'm at the end. We, um, I think we're at the end of our slides. So I'm gonna come, I'm gonna stop sharing and then we are gonna open it up for Q&A. Thank you all so much for participating. Okay. So, um, Angel, and as you were presenting, a couple of questions came up and it was regarding um, about the pool for, for hiring. And so how big is the pool for minimum, uh, you know, minimum of two people, question mark? Can you clarify the hiring pool? Yes, absolutely. So the final, final group of people, your, your final selection um, out of that list. So for example, I personally opened up a rec and I literally had a hundred and I think 25 applicants. And so between myself and my um, director, we went through and whittled them down to say, okay, out of these 125, here's the top 20 that we want to phone screen. And so between the three of us, myself, my HR business partner, and my director, we phone screened all 20 of those people. Then we narrowed it down from there to the list of the top 10. Then we narrowed it down to the list of the top five, right? Then we narrowed it down a little bit further to the top three. So we had three candidates in that final, final pool that says, okay, we think all three of these candidates would be great. We think all three of these individuals could do a phenomenal job. The, the final three, happen to have two females and one male. Just happened, <laughs> just by coincidence. All right, so I got lucky, right, that that happened for me. And, um, and then, like I said, out of, out of those three, one of those women ended up going on to be um, a, a director for my agile practice. So that, that just worked out. However, it did not work out for my supervisor. So my supervisor, his name is Scott at the time, he was looking to um, create an agile um, project management practice and he was looking for a leader. And the recruiters kept finding what he said. He, you know, he's white male. He said, all these older white men that kept coming through the, the pipeline and I'm interviewing them. And it's like, he was like, it was like a repeat. It was like all these older white men who had been there and they were established and they had run project management offices probably in their sleep. And he said, that's just not what I wanted. I wanted someone who was, um, had, who was innovative and who had um, never run a global PMO before and had you know, a different way of seeing our business and how we could operate. And I kept telling them to go back. I kept saying, I'm not in a rush. I want to make sure that I'm hiring uh, for someone that has diversity of thought and not the same old project management manager that we've always had. I want to do something different. So he intentionally challenged the recruiter to go back and diversify those candidates that he could then interview. And it took a while, from my understanding, it took a while for them to find me. Um, and I, again, I made it all the way through, the, through to the end and um, through a lengthy recruitment and, and interview process uh, was hired on. So that's how it works. You have to be intentional. You have to challenge and say, nope, I want my candidate pool diverse. And there are some organizations that are actually training um, their hiring committees on how to have more diversity in the hiring committee, but also about more um, 
cultural sensitivity, awareness, and diversity awareness as they're interviewing. So that's a really great example for all of us. Um, the other question is, why is sponsorship as much or more important than hiring? Oh, okay, hiring versus sponsorship. Um, well, here's the, the here, look at it this way, okay? And a lot of companies are starting to realize this. When you lead with diversity first and inclusion second, what happens is you unintentionally create a revolving door. So you get diverse candidates in the door, right? You've reached out to the HBCUs. You've reached out, especially, let's be real. This is, this is really impactful for us in Indiana. Okay, let's keep it real. So my friends, my colleagues who are outside of the state, who are outside of the Midwest, who live on the coast or in the South, are like, are you still living in that cornfield, girl? And I'm like, it's Indianapolis. I'm not in the middle. I'm not out in Lafayette somewhere. I'm, I'm in the city, right? I'm a city girl. And, but their perception of Indiana, of the state of Indiana, is that it's one big giant cornfield. And so how am I going to recruit? How am I going to attract top talent into my organizations, but more importantly, have them stay, right? You're, I'm, do you know how much money it is that you put out? Any average, I'm going to say somewhere in the average neighborhood of about 60 to 70 grand, probably more if you're a bigger company, that a company is shelling out to have an, to, have, to bring in talent into their organization, right? If you think about it, the recruiter, the time it takes for hiring managers to interview and phone screen and review candidates and resumes, that whole process is about somewhere in the neighborhood of about 70 grand, okay, to bring in one person. I don't want all that going out the door because I get them here and they're not happy, they don't feel included or they don't belong, right? So you want to lead with inclusion first, and one of the ways that you can lead with inclusion first is by sponsoring the talent that you already have in the door, right? That you already had, they're already invested, they're already loyal, they're already a part of the company. So look for those leaders that could be um, potentially uh, senior leaders or at the executive level, look for those top talented individuals and groom them up, sponsor them up through the org, right? And now as you're doing that, you're creating inclusive practices. You're challenging, well, how do we even, how have we gone about identifying top talent? How do we nurture them? How do we get them to the next level? How do we make sure that they have the skills and experiences necessary? So as you're going through that process, you're, you're now naturally creating an environment that's more inclusive so that when you are ready to hire diverse talent in, they're more likely to stay. That is such a great counsel, Angel, because, you know, hiring is great, right? Um, but what we sometimes frequently see is that you hire, but you don't retain. And the reason is, is because you have broken culture, right? So if you don't fix your culture, then you don't retain those people that you work so hard to hire. So that is such good counsel, Angel. Thank you for that. The other question that came in, Angel, was as a white person, how do I become a better ally? What can I do? Yeah. Big um, question. Big question. Well, actually, no, it's easy. It really is an easy question. It's, it's meet somebody that's different than you. It really is just that simple. It's, it's be intentional about having coffee, lunch, dinner with someone that has a different ex lived experience than you. Uh, the two great examples that it happened to me where I immediately felt, felt included is I joined the Board of Family Promise um, this past summer. And the majority, and they were specific, I mean, they were intentional and, and vocal about looking for diverse board representation, right? So um, they got me and they're like, are there any more people like you? <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, actually I know a lady over here. Let's bring her in too. So the two of us join, we're both African-American females. We are the only two African-American females on the entire board. Um, the, the board is very well represented in, in terms of gender, right? There's plenty of, of female and plenty of male representation, but we're the only two African-Americans. And it was kind of like that, 
um, why do all the black kids sit at the lunch table? So at every board meeting, her and I are sitting together, right? And we're talking and we're sharing notes and we, we hang out in the parking lot afterwards and talk. And one of the, and the, one of the gentlemen, his name is John, he just came up and started talking to us. And we were, you know, we found we had a few things in common and he's like, hey, do you guys want to go out to dinner with me and my husband? like next week or so we're like yeah let's go we went out to cooper's hawk and had a blast i'm like john you're my new best friend right and and his husband can cook too by the way so um <laughs> so right there instant connection and i remember i text her after after our dinner and i said i love this board like i was actually thinking about oh i'll probably be here for a year and i'm out but after that, I felt so included and so ingrained in the mission and what they were doing that I instantly was like, I'm connected, right? And then the second thing that happened was um, I had a gentleman, uh, and you guys probably heard me talk about Dave. I talk about Dave all the time. Dave was the first supervisor I had as an intern when I worked at Lilly. And I had him again as a supervisor at the uh, end of my time at Lilly. And during that time, we were having a one-on-one -on -one, and Dave looks at me and he goes, Angel, you're killing it. You're, you're doing really good. Like, you know, don't beat yourself up. That project was rough, but you're holding your own girl because you are the only sister among all these middle-aged white dudes. You're, you're doing good. And Dave actually said that. He said those words to me. I, Dave's my best friend this day. Dave's the one that helped me with the title of the book, right? just because he just said what we all knew when we were thinking, um, but, but he said it and he instant connection, right? And again, I had known Dave for years. He was my supervisor when I was an intern, but by him saying what he said, I'm like, he sees me, he sees me. And from that point on, we had another deeper layer of connection that has lasted to this day. That's awesome. And there's two more questions Angel, um, uh, one is how do I help promote inclusivity in my company and organization when I don't work with many, sometimes any black men or women? Um, you, you have to be, you have to reach out past the borders of your organization. So if you happen to be sitting in an organization, a company um, that is predominant, it's just majority white, um, and you're like, I would love to set up tea and coffee with somebody else, but we don't have anybody else yet. You please utilize this forum, utilize women in high tech, um, utilize the associations and the groups that you're a part of um, and, and be intentional about reaching out and connecting because you never know that connection could lead you to someone else who could lead you to like your next potential new hire. And, and while you're working on inclusivity and change and making changes in your environment, you now are looking to, you know, you're making connections with folks that can, can bring in. I tell, I tell my team all the time, if you have a, an opening, whether it's an analyst or an SVP, let me know, use my connections, use my associations with BDPDA, BDPA and ITSMF and and, um, and you know, Black Girls Code and all these different organizations that are particularly targeted to women or minorities in STEM. And let me tap those networks so that we can fill, we can make sure that we have two in a pool. Excellent. And, and there are some comments coming in. You know, you can join the Indie Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, you can get connected to Indie Black MBA. There is, there are a number BDPA, if you're not familiar, um, it's, it's just BDPA, like it's FFA or KFC now, the brand, but it stands for Black Data Processors Association. Um, so you can connect with those organizations, but the other thing you can do is just host an event. I've been in those situations where you know, you hear from friends like there isn't anybody of color in my organization. So how am I supposed to do this? Invite them, invite a speaker to come and speak to your organization, because even if you don't have internal inclusivity, <laughs> right, if you don't have internal diversity, you can invite diversity to your organization. Um, I will say to the the other question that came in was. 
how do you, what, what is your advice or counsel um, to the onlys? So if you know, and you join an organization where you are an only, then how do you, how do you build a network of allies? How, how do you take care of yourself in that situation? Yeah. <laughs> First, get the book. <laughs> the whole first part of the book is about being the only, because that's usually what that's usually my my thing. Um, so, but yes, absolutely, your girl tribe is critical. Having women that are supporting other women absolutely critical. So build that tribe up. Um, it it absolutely should and can be diverse. It can have men. Um, women of different ethnicities and cultures, but you definitely want to get that support from others for sure. And around self-care, um, I, I recommend radical self-care these days, right? So before the pandemic, I was talking about Manny petties and go to the spa day. Honey, we are past that. It is like a spa weekend retreat down with the Sisters of Women in High Tech at French Lick type, you know, um, self-care. Okay. That's what we're, that's the level of self-care we're talking, where you take a day, you take a state where you, you take a week, you take a staycation and you send the kids to grandma and the hubby goes on a golf, golf outing with the boys and you're there by yourself, right. For like a week. And, and, you know, and, um, also to just, um, what I've learned through this journey is being more mindful of your feelings. Being, being mindful of when you're having those good days and those bad days. And when it's tough to be on Zoom all day and gone day, you got two hour meetings back to back to back. And maybe sometimes you got to go off Zoom and just say, hey guys, I'm yellow today. That's a new thing that we're doing at our company. Are you red, yellow, or green? And if you're, if you're, if you're, or if you're red, you're, it's a rough day, you might, you might be off camera that day. So, so being intentional and thinking more about your own feelings and, and how you are in your body and, your, and how your gut is feeling, that's something that I've um, found to be a really great self-care practice. And listen to your body. Don't ignore it when it's talking to you. I think that that's such great counsel because I think that is what is missing. And, you know, in this pandemic, what we've seen is an exodus of women from STEM careers. We also see more women that the responsibility is on them to take care of the elderly, to take care of the sick person. They're busy. There's so much to carry and it's so important. And I know that some people go, oh, well, it's holiday, you know, but it's serious. Sometimes you do, and, and I agree with you, Angel, sometimes you need to distance yourself. And I think those retreats, there are several, there was something you did last year where it was, I think almost a half day and it started with yoga and it was on Zoom. And then it was just this very calming, it was really awesome. The retreats that you see, those things that you can do. Sometimes it's just pinging somebody where you can lean in and bend, but make sure and take care of yourself. And, and I, I completely agree with you and thank you so much for sharing that wisdom with us today, Angel. Are there any other questions? You're, ha you're, you're welcome to speak up. If, if you're not comfortable, you can connect with Angel on LinkedIn. Angel, if you can put your LinkedIn address in, connect with Angel, get her book. Um, there are so many events that we are hosting um, for women in high tech. Um, where we're trying to really lean in um, and help women with their career, negotiate, network, but also take care of themselves. So please make sure and follow those events, um, become engaged and involved. The one thing that I will share with you before we wrap up is years ago, I was in a situation and it was very hard. And um, I got to where I was very depressed and there were a few days where I was so depressed, in fact, and that's not my normal, if anybody knows me, it's not my, my normal demeanor. I'm a pretty joyous person, um, but I was so depressed that some days I couldn't get out of bed. Um, the treatment at work was so bad. And so one day I was like, I'm going to reach out to someone. And so I reached out to a woman named Teresa Conroy Roth. 
Um, and she met me, she met with me. And, um, and I was, by the way, and only in my organization. Um, and so we sat down to have coffee and she started asking me all of these questions, like interviewing me almost. And I was looked at her like, you're interviewing me? What's that about? Um, and what it was, she said, clearly, you are, you are more than qualified for your job. So this doesn't have anything to do with you not being qualified. So check that imposter syndrome box, right? Uh-uh, this isn't you. This is the environment. So I'm going to give you a couple of things to do. Number one, you know what? If you need to leave, go. Don't overstay. Don't do it to yourself. Um, and we have something coming up uh, in May where we're going to talk about that. Um, she said, if you can stay until you hit the two year mark, then do that. And my two year mark was only four months away. She said, but the other thing you need to do is you need to get engaged in your community. Go to different events become involved. Even if you don't think it, it's applicable to you, go learn and be connected. So I started attending women in high tech events and I'll call out Kristen Cooper. It was the very first time I attended a, um, a startup study hall um, was when I was moving through it. It was Birds Unlimited. I went to that and it was like, I have no idea why I'm going to this, but I'm going to follow the counsel of Teresa. And before you know it, I started feeling better. So make sure and do that. Get involved and engaged with organizations in the community. You will be surprised how much it can help you. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, there is a drawing. We're going to do it after um, so we can get you um, to your next meeting and you can have a quick bio before you hit that one o'clock. Um, so we will send out five people will win $20 uh, DoorDash gift cards for joining us virtually today. We hope that our future sessions are in person, but we wanted to be respectful when we have COVID still, we're still in a pandemic. So thank you so much for your time and attention today. Angel, you're the bomb.com. Thank you so much for being here and sharing wisdom with us. Snaps and claps, lady. Um, please make sure and attend future sessions with women in high tech. Follow Angel on LinkedIn, get yourself a book, and take care of yourself today and every single day. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.